Welcome. I am so glad that you've joined me here today. And I have um, Zoe Edwards from Check Your Thread podcast here with me today. And I am just so thrilled to have her on as a guest. And so Zoe, go ahead and take a minute and introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about you. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is very exciting. So yeah, my name is Zoe Edwards. I live in the southeast of the UK um, near a city called Brighton. Um, I am a podcaster. I've been making a podcast about sewing more sustainably. My podcast is called Check Your Thread. That's been going for about three years. But I've been obsessed with sewing and blogging about sewing for about 15 years now. Um, it's also kind of my job. I mean, obviously now I'm a podcaster as well, but I'm a writer. Um, I've written a book about mending and um, sometimes I teach sewing classes as well. Um, yeah, so it's been my passion and my kind of main income now for a long time. And it, and I'm very lucky to to have those two uh, things side by side, I guess. Yeah. Oh, I have to agree with you so much on that. Isn't it just the best thing ever to be able to do something you love for Absolutely. an income? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Very privileged in that sense. Definitely. So how did you get started in sewing? I know we all seem to have different journeys that brought us to this place. Absolutely. Well, okay, I'll try and do one quickly. But basically, um, I guess sewing was kind of always been in my life since I was little. My mum was a seamstress for a while. My nan was a seamstress. Um, and in fact, when I was really small, my mum did um, dressmaking and alterations, much like yourself, at home, um, you know, to make it ends meet whilst I was tiny. Um, and so it's just always been part of kind of you know, what you do to fix clothes or to alter clothes. My mum is very small. She's only five foot. So she's always altering like thrifted garments and stuff. So I guess that was my first kind of introduction. And then, you know, costumes for plays and dance things and stuff. But it took me quite a long time to realise that sewing and clothing could be um, a tool of self-expression you know it took mm. me quite a lot a long time to kind of throughout my teens like exploring different kind of arty disciplines you know and it took me a while to realize that oh clothing is my thing and and then it took me a bit longer to work out that you could actually sew clothing which is ridiculous because I just didn't ever think of it as a kind of expressive exciting medium because I guess seeing someone always do alterations that doesn't look much fun you know so no offense <laughs> but when no she offense was like, taken and then went so over the sewing machine because you know she was trying to you know you've got the the buttons on a, mm -hmm. a blazer you know and you've and it's all fancy and you've got to, oh yeah that's not fun but yeah so it took me a quite a while to realize that it could be creative and then I went to university and I studied fashion design. Um, oh. I wanted to be a designer. Like the course I was taking was specifically kind of fashion design. Um, but we did do some practical classes in like manufacture and in pattern cutting. And those were actually the parts that I enjoyed the most. Like I'm not a very good oh. designer. <laughs> but I really liked the technical bits. Um, and I liked the, yeah, I liked exploring that aspect of of, of creating clothing. Um, and then I did some stupid jobs after university, but eventually got into what I thought I wanted to do, which is to work in the fashion industry. Because, you know, as a student, as a fashion student, that's what you're kind of pushed towards. So I finally kind of in my mid 20s started working in some clothing companies in London um, and quickly kind of got quite disillusioned because I. Um, I mean, there's a lot of waste, <laughs> you know, we know that now there's a lot of waste in, in, in the fashion industry. And, um, I kind of saw that it, as my, mm. in my role as production assistant. So although there were, the manufacture wasn't happening in the UK, the manufacture was happening mm. in, um, factories in Romania and Eastern Europe. Um, I'm still really aware of, there was a lot of, 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 yeah, a lot of waste and we were creating garments that were not going to last very long. Um, the mm -hmm. fabric was really poor quality. Um, and this was kind of in my kind of mid-20s when my own personal kind of figuring out who I was and what I was passionate about and how I wanted to live my life 
was kind of going on, you know, and I was really kind of getting more of a sense of wanting to live more sustainably, although a lot of the language we use now isn't necessarily mm-hmm. that we had then, you know. So my kind of job was like in one direction and my personal mm-hmm. passions were kind of going in the other direction and it, 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 yeah, it didn't really work. So I kind of quit that. But I've continued to sew like as a hobby, like I was always making bags mm-hmm. and having little, you know, craft stools and stuff. And then it took me, um, so then I went to move to Spain for a couple of years. And then when I moved back to the UK, I was able to find a job working in a, um, in a, in a textile recycling charity, actually. Mm-hmm. And um, when I was living in Spain, like I really started to get passionate about sewing my own clothes and, and using that as a form of extracting myself from fast fashion and also as a form of expression as well. Um, and then I was really lucky to find this job in a textile recycling charity making like a small range of women's wear so I was kind of finally managed to find a job that had both my passion of making an expression Mm -hmm. but also in a way that felt more in alignment with how I was starting to view Mm -hmm. the world you know and um I yeah and I did that for a couple of years that was amazing and then um when they closed the studio I transitioned into teaching sewing classes so I've been teaching about sewing writing about sewing and podcasting about sewing ever since. Oh, wow. I love it. I did not know so many of those fun facts about you. So that's (laughs) really cool how you um, (laughs) came to this journey. And um, now that you are do it so much for work, etc. Do you find that you still have time to like do it at home? I mean, I've seen some of your things on Instagram that you've done for your home I'd love to have you like share about a couple of them sure well do you want to to me to talk specifically about that the things I make for my home or kind of how I fit sewing into my home life um so definitely um how do you fit sewing into your home life like are you do you still sew at home a bit even though you're doing yeah yeah, so I'm not sewing for a job now. I'm just talking okay. about sewing and writing about sewing and okay. and and sometimes teaching sewing. Um, but now I also I work one day at a fabric company as well. So oh. I have my hand in that side of things as well. But um yes, I still do a lot of sewing. Um I have two children, so gone are the times where I have a full weekend or a full afternoon to do some sewing, but sewing is still really important to me and it's something I have to do for my mental health really um it's yeah it's really important just to get that little bit of time to myself where I can just focus on yeah creating basically it's that simple isn't it creating something that expresses a part of me that isn't going to come undone immediately (laughs) you know (laughs) Um, yeah, so how I fit it into my life. Yeah, I think having to accept that gone are those long weekends of mm. being able to do a project from start to finish, you know, um, to, just accepting that little and often, little and often mm. is going to be the best yeah. bet, like getting those small little chunks when you can um, is really important. And even just... 20 minutes and I feel better you know I feel like I've pushed my project along I've had that little bit of space to myself my little bit of brain space to kind of recalibrate a little bit um it's really really healthy so um yeah yeah that's important do you find do you sew like in the evening or in the morning or like do you are you able to sew a little bit every day or almost every day I would say most days, but it tends to be when at least one of my children has gone to bed. (laughs) But I have to say, and this is the thing that I would really like so many people, especially people who are parents um, or, you know, carers of some regard, you've got to prioritize. So you've got to bring it more into like the priority list because you can't wait until every other job in your home is complete before you do some sewing because a you'll be exhausted and you won't have a good time when we do some sewing and b that there's never ever ever going to be a time where everything is done is there's always something you know yeah yeah for sure and I know I love how you mentioned that um 
it's part of your mental space because I think we forget that. And even though I sew for people and a lot of times when I'm sewing, it is for people, but like if there is a time when I've just had a full day of doing other stuff, I just want to like crawl down in my sewing room and shut the door and be like, don't talk to me for two hours. I, and because even if I'm working on someone else's project, it just clears my mind. I just get in my head and just relax. And it's lovely. Yeah. For fantastic. sure. Yeah. I just, I just wish people would, whatever it is for them, whether, you know, mm. whether it's yoga, whether it's going for a walk, whether it's meditation, whether it's cooking, whatever it is, just bring it more down the you know it's important yeah. especially yeah. As, you know as parents we do tend to end up at the bottom of the rung of the priority list don't we and and that's not good for anyone no no you know? no it's not so then also so I know you do make a lot of your own uh, your own clothes and things like that but I, I've also seen you do a bit of um I wouldn't say necessarily upcycling but repairing things in your house or whether it's your kids clothes or um, like, do you have a um, maybe a favorite scenario or, or a favorite project that you've been able to work on that you've been able to maybe salvage something or recreate it or yeah, anything like sure. that? Yeah. I mean, I have to say if it was a case of mending something or making something from scratch, I would prioritize mend take making something from scratch. But I do really see the appeal and the importance, obviously, but also the appeal and the quick fix fun of getting something mm -hmm. mended and back in the wardrobe really quickly, you know. But then sometimes there's those projects that it's not a quick fix and you're not necessarily sure how to approach it. And you have to dwell on it for a while. But I had a couple of garments um, in my wardrobe that I just wasn't wearing for for whatever mm -hmm. reason. And then finally, um, over this winter period, I've been taking part in a challenge called the Winter of Care and Repair, oh. um, which is hosted by Gina Wigger. You can find her on Instagram at The People's Mending. Um, she hosts a really fun challenge every year that goes from the winter solstice to the spring equinox. And okay. you'll encourage, I mean, you can create the the pledge or the challenge, however you want to word it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but you're encouraged to do an act of care and repair very regularly throughout that period. Mm -hmm. And that has been the real kick up the bum that I needed to get some of those garments really addressed. And mm -hmm. some of them were like, I had a, a top that was a close fit top and it had a funnel neck, but something about the proportions of it wasn't quite right and it didn't feel good. So I took off the funnel neck and I managed to create so and then I recut the neckline just to mm. make it a gentle scoop and I was able to splice the funnel neck part to make the neck band and so that was really satisfying so it looked very intentional like mm. I didn't have to have a contrast I mean a contrast neck band would look cool but for this particular garment because it was a print I wanted it to be the same yep. fabric so that was really fun. And then I just had a couple of, um, oh, I had a stripy top that had, it once again, it was kind of a funnel neck, but it was a weird funnel neck that was kind of grown on. And it meant that I could never put a cardigan on it because the neckline was a bit wide and I love a cardigan. Mm -hmm. So I just saw, I just ended it, I just addressed that and just made it into like a really simple kind of bateau neckline. And I've worn that a ton since. And yeah. I must admit yeah. it was sitting there for a long time until that kick up the bum, but I'm so pleased that I did get around to doing it, you know? Yeah. Isn't it amazing how we have those things that we think we might love the print or for the most part we love something, but if it's just, right, a neckline or some certain piece of it that doesn't feel comfortable or doesn't really fit our style, like the cardigan, and like just processing through that well what am I going to do like what is the issue why am I not wearing it yeah, I feel yeah, like yeah. that's always really um enlightening to try and figure that out and then you can kind of like problem solve so I love that that you're able to fix those yeah. and get those back and, in I, and I was sharing that on Instagram as well because I think sometimes just somebody seeing that would be like 
oh mm. that could help me and I think that that's so important to these simple fixes sometimes you just need to see it so mm -hmm. I try and share those things when I'm doing it they don't necessarily make the most exciting post but um yeah, I really hope that people then sure. take that board and even if they don't use it straight away they'll be like when they do mm -hmm. have a garment that's not working like oh yeah hang on <laughs> you know and they can think about it yeah yeah um for sure so in terms of also, I mean, in, in that case, there's that element of you're also like saving money because you're not going to go and you buy a new item. You're able to fix it. Um, and I know you've done a couple things for your kids. I'm trying to remember what the project was. Um, was it a swimsuit or swim trunks? Have you done the, some of those? Maybe that wasn't... I have I have I do make quite a lot of stuff for my kids okay. and making swimwear is actually something I do for them because oh. um you can often get them out of such a small amount of fabric you know true true yeah I um have to say that's not something that I have raved oh really <laughs> I shouldn't say that um I think this it just like the thought of making it from all of that stretchy fabric I'm like uh <laughs> yes I've definitely repaired enough or like yeah. ripped in swimwear and then made it fit but um since you sew from home do you have your own like space that you have organized for sewing or are you kind of in the main living space I always like to ask that too because sometimes I think if someone doesn't have their own space then it becomes kind of well I can't or I don't know how to make that work so I was curious how you make that work in your your own like lifestyle sure, sure. well like many people in the UK my home is a lot smaller than probably mm. many North American homes, to be honest. So our, we, I live in a really small house, um, two bedrooms. It's basically the downstairs is all one room plus a kitchen. So the lounge diner is all one room and mm. at one end of it, my husband has a desk that's his writing desk. And the other end, I have a desk next to the dining table that is my sewing little space mm -hmm. and it actually works really really well I'm very lucky that I have a small table there and I can put my machine up there permanently so I don't have to take it down mm -hmm. really lucky to have and I know that a lot of people don't even get that you know mm -hmm. um, and then I have a couple of shelves above that and I've got my patterns in like binders mm -hmm. you know my pdf patterns I've printed out in binders um and some tools and then on the other side of the room I've got it's it's what uh it's like a cupboard basically it kind of looks like a wardrobe but it's got shelves inside and I have some more patterns in there and some more bits and notions and stuff and my fabric lives in our airing cupboard in our bathroom it works it works that's it perfect works. Yeah, um, <laughs> yes I mean I definitely love that um you're able to make it work because then it doesn't become like an excuse. And I know um, there was a couple of years. It is definitely interesting. I remember hearing you say that on one of your podcasts, how the um, you were talking to someone else that was from like North America, where our homes are often bigger than uh, and right here. It's often, well, I just don't have enough space is like the, what I'll hear people say or they don't know how to fit it in and the, the feeling of like well I need to have a separate room for everything mm -hmm. yeah. um and yet like all growing up I did we didn't have a separate room it was you just pull it out and often it was like the dining room table or something where we'd be sewing so sure um, I love that that or or we had one time we did have a walk-in closet where I think we put the table and a sewing machine and a light in there. Oh, cute. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's lovely. We see we yeah. don't really have walk-in closets in the UK. So right, that's not right. the dream. <laughs> yeah, this was probably the only house I ever lived in with a walk-in closet. I know lots of people, but we don't have any walk-in closets in my house either. Yeah, so yeah. I think um, you're right. I think that there is this um there is this perception, isn't there, that sewing, to, to mm -hmm. be a good sewer, to be like a really like successful sewer, you should have like your own room and it should be white and it should have 
all this storage and it should have these brand right. new machines and they should be up permanently and you should have a massive cutting table at the precise right height and and that anything less isn't going to be proper and that's just not true that's right. just not right. true you know yeah. you can make your work and and yeah. I actually think I prefer to be if I even if, if we had like a spare room say upstairs mm-hmm. and I could make that into my sewing room I think that I don't think I would do so much sewing because I think that I enjoy the time that I can be downstairs like maybe my daughter's doing some drawing and my husband's yes. I don't know, doing something else and in the same room, you know, and yes. I guess they yes. have to be interacting with them continuously, but they're there and we're together, you know? Yes. Yeah. I, I love that you said that too. There was like two years where we were trying to make space for my sewing where I like was working out of the living room and I do miss that a little. And I have to say, if it wasn't for the fact of I just, because of like the dresses and all of that, that I get from people, um, I know there was something really nice about sewing in that like they would be, you yeah. know, one of them would be playing Legos on the floor and one of them might be watching a show, but yeah, like I can sew and we would ch- chat or not chat, you know, like it did feel like just having the presence. So I, that's really, yeah, really good. Yeah. Um, on my podcast recently, I spoke to, um, a designer called Liz Elliott, who is a zero waste pattern designer for children. She creates oh. children's patterns. Not all of her patterns are zero waste. Mm-hmm. Some of them aren't, some of them are. Um, but, um, obviously through the podcast, I was particularly interested in the zero waste aspect, but she was saying that she, I mean, she has children quite a similar age to mine, actually. Um, I, I guess are around the age of 10, um, she actually rented out a studio and has a separate studio outside of her home. But she's actually, when the lease is finished, she's not going to renew. She's going to mm-hmm. bring it back into her home, into her basically sewing off her dining table. And this is someone whose whole job is mm-hmm. developing sewing patterns and making samples. And and she's decided that it her life works better mm-hmm. when... It's a mm-hmm. home and she can do the thing where like, oh, that what, you know, the washing load is finished. I'll just put that out before I do something else. And, yes. and that can actually be a benefit, you know, mm-hmm. rather than like a substitute for something else, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So... I did, when, I, when I heard that, I was like, that really that legitimizes things for a lot of people. And I, and I loved hearing it. Mm. Yeah, for sure. So to wrap up, one last tip that I love to share with listeners is what is your favorite sewing tool? If you have a favorite sewing tool to share. Okay. Okay. This is, I don't know, someone said this before, but just good pins, good Mm -hmm. pins that are the right thickness for the fabric that you're sewing with, you know, like if you're working with something fine, some good fine pins. If you're working with something thicker, some thick pins, well, no, sturdy pins, I should say, but, you know, that aren't going to bend um, and they're not blunt. <laughs> That's it. Just want some good pins. It makes things so much better. Mm-hmm. It makes things so much more enjoyable, yeah. I think. Yeah, for sure. Right. Those times that we've been doing a project and we have blunt pins and it's just like what either you're going to like tear a hole, not, but create that run in the fabric or you're just sitting there and it's not even going through. <laughs> Oh, it just it's not fun I don't like no, that no. yeah it's so, awful um so thank you so much I loved hearing so much more about you and learning about your journey and sewing and remind listeners like where can they find you and like what social pr- platform would you prefer to you know if they like to follow along yeah well thank you so much for having me this has been really really fun it's been very fun to have the tables turned as well it's been really good um so you can listen to my podcast check your thread on any podcast app or you can find it on spotify or you can find it um on our website checkyourthread.com um you can find me on instagram at uh sozo blog and you can find the podcast on instagram at check your thread great oh that's wonderful and yeah be sure to check out um zoe's podcast there's so much i think one of my all-time favorite would have been the the episode that you did on sewing machine repair oh Um, yeah just because i thought it was so it was just so valuable there's i love so many other the episodes but that one was just incredibly valuable i was like wow i'm so glad you're addressing that so thank you um, a lot of people um say um yeah, I wasn't sure I was going to listen because the title didn't sound very interesting, but I listened and I loved it. So I'm like, 
good. Oh, that's I need, great. That's I need to great. come up with better titles, clearly, but I'm glad people powered through and listened to it yes. anyway. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Zoe. Thank you. Thanks so much. And as always, be sure to sign up for my bi-weekly Sewing Circle newsletter, which you can find in the show notes below.